Today, I want to talk a little bit about being energized by the power of God, operating in the power of the name of Jesus and what that really, really means. Um, you know, oftentimes we talk about speaking the name of Jesus, but when we speak the name of Jesus as a church, you can just speak the name of Jesus if you want to, but when we speak it as a church, we're declaring something. We're declaring who he is. He's the authority of our life. He's the savior of our life. He's the one that come and rescued us out of darkness and delivered us into the wonderful light. And we have a purpose and we have a passion and we're living that out. And we encourage you to do that as a church family. So we're declaring who he is uh, in our life today when we sing that song and we share his word. If you have your Bibles with you today, I'm going to invite you to open it up to Ephesians chapter six. And we're going to be looking at how to operate in the mighty power of God's name and the power of the Lord. Because I think it's really important for us in a world that oftentimes is a plagued with what we refer to as darkness or evil. We need to figure out how to operate in the name of the Lord and bring light into darkness. And it's very, very difficult sometimes. But one of the secrets to operating in this world and being who God has created you to be is to understand the power of oneness and the power of unity. Everybody say unity. unity. And the book of Ephesians is basically a letter that was written to the church at Ephesus that was made up of Jewish believers and uh, people who were outside of Judaism known in that day as Gentiles. And Jesus had come he had brought those two groups together, and the writer here is encouraging them to operate as one, to operate as a unit, to operate with, with the authority of God over their life and be who God had created them to be in the world. It wasn't about being Jewish or it wasn't about being Gentile. It was about coming underneath the authority of God and what he had done through Christ Jesus and being one and operating in that. And that's what we want to encourage you in today is to unify with the local church. It's great for you to know who God is, but God is calling his church to unity. Everybody say unity. unity. And it's a really, really important thing how to operate in unity. Lots of times the enemy divides us, doesn't he? He divides us because of, you know, some of the likes and dislikes we have as a church. You know, oftentimes we divide into denominations, Baptist, Pentecostal, you know, there's the Catholicism, there's Presbyterian, there's now today the popular non-denominational church like we are, right? And honestly, it's really not about being the non-denominational, about being Catholic, about being, you know, Baptist, about being Pentecostal. It's about living out your purpose and being who God has created us to be as ones who have called out of darkness into the wonderful light and having the authority of Jesus over our life. And we're a church that, that really challenges you to step into the fullness of who God says you are. It's one thing to know who God is. It takes it to a whole different level when you operate and participate and you become who he says you are. And I need you to know today, God didn't call you to be a spectator. He called you to be a participator. Come on, somebody. Not to just be a fan that sits in the stands, but to be a player that gets on the field and do something with your life. But if you're going to play the game and you're going to be who God called you to be, you're going to be a part of the local church. You need to understand that there's enemies that come against us. And we're not, we're not here to fight against each other. We're here to build one another up in the faith and, and begin to share this love and this goodness of who God is in the world. And so the writer, he writes about all this oneness. And then at the end of his letter, he says something incredible about operating in the mighty power of God or in the name of Jesus. And it's found in your Bible in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. This is what it says. It says, be strong in the Lord. Speaking of Jesus there. See, be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and his mighty power. So how do we stay strong in Jesus and his mighty power? The same power, the Bible says, that elevated Jesus from the dead and resurrected him the Bible says that, that same power is available to you and me. Now, that doesn't mean that you know, if you fall out physically dead here right now, 
that you're probably going to, you know, get back up and start walking. What that means is that, you know what, that same power that was displayed through the resurrection of Christ, it's available for you to operate in this world and be who God's called you to be. And so how do you exercise that power? How do you live out that power? It's much different than the world around you would begin to say how you exercise power. It's not about lording over somebody. It's about having a Lord in your life. It's about having a leader in your life. It's about having an authority over your life. And whenever we don't operate in the authority of the mighty power of God, we miss so much about what God wants to do in and through our life. So here the writer reminds the people, he says, here, he says, operate in that mighty power and here's how you do it. He goes on in Ephesians 6, verse 11 and 12, and he says this. He says, put on. Everybody say, put on. Put on. That's some of the key to how to operate in God's amazing power. He says, put on all of God's armor so that, everybody say, so that. It's a purpose clause. See, that's one of the biggest things you have to get in your heart if you're going to be all of who God created you to be. There's a purpose of why God calls you out of darkness into the wonderful light. It says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. It goes on to say in verse 12, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities in the unseen world, against the mighty powers in the dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Plural, spirits in the heavenly places. It goes on to say in Ephesians 6, verses 13 through 17, says it again, put on. If you want to operate in God's mighty power, Live in the name of Jesus. The Bible says you've got to put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, he says, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. In addition to all of these, he says, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. There's some key elements right there in that short passage that begins to tell us how to operate in God's mighty power. And it's, it's all prefaced with, with putting on this, this armor as the writer writes it in order to fight the evil forces. Now, what the writer is doing here, he's referring back to Isaiah. And he's referring back to a prophet, Isaiah, before King Jesus ever arrived, arrived on the scene. And the prophet Isaiah depicted this messianic king to be, to be like a, a warrior, one that would be in, in great armor. And so the writer is saying, you know what? If, if you want to succeed in life, you have to put on... This, this full armor of Jesus, you have to dress yourself in Jesus. So how do you dress yourself in Jesus? I know we can say the name of Jesus, but literally, how do you as a believer or we as a church dress up in Christ Jesus? Because it's really important for us to learn how to put him on if we're going to fully function and be everything that God has created us to be. And if, if we're going to begin to be all the churches to be in a community, in a city, you know, in the world, we have to learn to put, to put on the messianic king, or we have to learn to dress ourselves in the fullness of who Jesus, who Jesus is. And so how do you put on anything? Well, you have to be aware of what, what that something is, and you have to participate with it. So, so you don't put on your clothes without being aware that they are clothes. And unless somebody else dresses you, you don't put on clothes unless you participate and, and do something and, and dress yourself in those clothes. So you have to train yourself how to dress properly, don't you? 
I mean, think just a moment, you know, for, with me for a minute. You didn't just learn automatically how to put your shoes on. Probably you had some parent or guardian that taught you how to put your shoes on. And that parent or guardian not only taught you how to put your shoes on, eventually they probably taught you how to tie your shoes, right? And as they taught you how to tie your shoes, they did it for a reason. They taught you to participate and keep your shoes tied so you don't trip and you don't fall and you don't hurt yourself. And so what we have to learn to do is put on Christ in the same way. In other words, God teaches us how the, these elements or the parts of Christ, so to say, how to, how to dress ourselves in, in those things, but he don't want to just teach us that so, so we can forget about it. He teaches us that so we don't trip and fall up and stumble all the days of our life. And so how you, how you put something on is you're aware of the pieces and then you participate daily in dressing yourself in this armor of God, so to say, so that we can together be who God has created us to be. And so I just want to talk about a minute about who we are in Christ, because literally that's what the scripture is saying. Do you know who you are in Christ? Because these pieces of an armor tell you who you are in Christ. And you're to put those things on so that you can operate daily and be exactly who God has called, called you to be. And oftentimes it takes training. You have to repeat it over and over and over. You have to remember it over and over, just like you learn to tie your shoes. Now it probably becomes natural to you. Do, do most people in here know how to tie their shoes? And the way you know how to tie your shoes is probably you've done it a bunch of times. You put them on and tied it a bunch of times. It's no different with who you are in Christ. And again, you have to do it repeatedly over and over and over again. And as you do it, as you put Christ on, as you dress yourself, as a matter of fact, here in, 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 in Ephesians, the writer says, look, you need to take off your old self and put on your new self. And so how, how you do that is simply remember what these, these pieces of armor represent and and who you are in Christ. So you may want to jot down a few of these things. You know, I, I, I need to take on the belt of truth. So what is the truth of Christ? The truth of Christ is, is basically reminding me that I am in Christ. I am a new creation. I am a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come is what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And the writer here depicts, he says, here, take off who you used to be and put on now, walk in who I say you are. You're created anew in Christ Jesus. In other words, your purpose has shifted. You're no longer basically operating in this world without a significant purpose and a part to play. And again, you're not, you're not just haphazardly going through the world as a human being. Now Christ has reconnected you to the creator. And because he has the power to reconnect you through the forgiveness of sin and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, now you can operate and be a reflection of the image of God in this world. Because God created you to be a reflection of who he is in the world. The Bible says in the beginning God created both man and woman in his image, in his likeness. And their purpose was to be fruitful, multiply, and reflect, or more or less display who he is in the world. Notice here, the Bible says in Ephesians that the real enemy isn't flesh and blood. It's not somebody else. The real enemy are the powers of darkness that blind your mind and my mind and other people's mind to who God is and what he wants to do in our life. And it's a fight, my friend, as a believer, to remind yourself, in Christ, I'm a new creation. The old is gone. I'm significant. I got a purpose. I'm not who I used to be. I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus, and I belong to God's family. See, yeah, go ahead. It's okay to clap in church. Sometimes we have to coach this 11 o'clock crowd a little bit, but it's okay to clap in church. 
But the reality of it is, it's something to celebrate. Being a new creation and belonging to a family. Again, the writer is, is declaring this idea of unity throughout the book of Ephesians. You're not a Gentile anymore. You're not just a person that belongs to Judaism anymore. There is a king who has arrived on the scene. His name is Jesus, and he brings people together. And he brings people together so they can operate and be who he's created them to be. It's not about being a Jew. It's not about being a Gentile. No longer let the enemy blind your mind to thinking it's about about just who you, how you're created to be as a human. No, it's how you're created in the image of God to reflect who God is as a human in this earth. And guess what? God can work through anybody and everybody. It doesn't matter what your background is. As a matter of fact, God, the Bible says that God is bringing people from all tribes, all tongues, and all nations together. Everybody say together. Together, together to reflect who he is in the world. And again, if you don't understand that that's why God brings us back to himself, then what happens is the enemy will begin to play tricks on your mind and begin to think it's about something else. But I have to remind myself of that truth. I have to remind myself of the truth that, that I'm fully forgiven. What God did on the cross fully forgave me of missing the mark of God's glorious standard. And, and, and I receive that forgiveness that Jesus offered through his perfect sacrifice on a cross. I don't have to earn it. I don't have to buy it. I don't have to perform to operate in God's family. All I have to do is receive the forgiveness and step by the power of the Holy Spirit towards my creator and operate in who he says I am. And my friends, so many people believe the lie that you can never be forgiven. Do you understand that's why Jesus died once on a cross? Was a display that God has the power to forgive sin everywhere once and for all time if you would choose to believe in who Christ Jesus is and, and, and forgiveness came from heaven into the human heart so they could be reconnected back to God. And you gotta put on this truth. In Christ, I am, I am fully rescued. I am fully salvaged. You have to remind yourself of that over and over again. It's not about me rescuing myself. It's about who Christ says I am. And my friend, in Christ, you have been rescued by the power of what Jesus did through the death, burial, and resurrection. In Christ, I am totally righteous. There's a, blessed, a breastplate of righteousness the, the writer describes here. And again, I have to put that on on a continual basis. It's not my righteousness, it's his righteousness. Because of his righteousness, I am made right with God. And some people get this backwards. They're always believing it's their righteousness that makes them right with God. And until you grab hold, no, righteousness comes from above. And you put that righteousness that comes from above, his name is Jesus, and you put that on your heart and your soul, then you can really never grab hold of what God wants to do in and through you. It's not because of who you are or who I am. It's simply because of who he is. We have to remember that. We have to put on the shoes of peace. And again, what, what does this simply mean? Simply, you know, the shoes were put on so a, a, a person could keep their footing in, in, in life. And so we have to put this peace on. But what we, what we begin not to, uh, what we don't understand sometimes is in the world, sometimes things aren't very peaceful. And it's really for, easy for us to look around and see that, don't, don't we? We see darkness sometimes looking to prevail. And it seems like things aren't very peaceful. But the reality of it is if we're going to operate and be who God has called us to be, we have to understand that Jesus came into this world to make peace with humanity. Between humanity and God. In other words, I like to say it this way. The cross is, is God's peace sign. And, it, and it's just simply saying, you know what? No longer do you have to stay apart from the creator anymore. In other words, you don't have to stay outside of the family anymore. Because I have made peace with humanity through Christ Jesus. And though there's no, sometimes no peace and a lot of unrest in the world, peace 
and moving forward is found whenever you know that Jesus made it possible for you to have peace with God and you put that on and you shod yourself in those particular shoes and you walk forward because you understand though peace might be, unrest may be all around you, you have peace with God because of who Christ Jesus is. This is what it begins to mean by putting on the full armor of God. Dressing yourself in who Jesus says you are in Christ. In Christ, we're more than conquerors. In Christ, we're the light of the world. In Christ, we're created to do greater things. In Christ, we can have joy in all circumstances. And see, that doesn't mean that, that the circumstances are always going to feel joyful. Because sometimes the circumstances are horrific. But what it does mean is because we know who we are in Christ, even though it looks like darkness is prevailing sometimes, just like it, it, it did at, at those schools in Texas this week. It's horrible. It's awful. And it doesn't mean we have joy because of those circumstances, but we can put our joy in who Christ is in spite of the circumstances. The circumstances are all around us. They, they, things happen all the time. We can't control circumstances on a continual basis. But what we can do is put our faith and our trust in who God is, and we can operate amidst the circumstances being who God called us to be. But oftentimes, you know, people, you know, begin to not hold on to who God says they are because of the circumstances. God calls us to oneness, to unity. And we have to put on who Christ is in order to operate and be exactly who he has created us to be. The writer continues on in Ephesians 6, verse 18. And he says something incredible here. He doesn't only say dress yourself in who Christ says you are. He goes on to say, pray in the Spirit at all times. He says, pray in the Spirit at all times and on every occasion. Whether it's good or whether it's bad. And so literally what this means is continually communicate with your great God, with your heavenly, with your heavenly Father. So how do you pray in the Spirit at all times? Does that mean you, you, you physically are saying something with your mouth at all times? No, what that means is your spirit is agreeing with him, the Holy Spirit, because he speaks to you and he guides and directs your life. And so on every occasion, no matter what's going on, you can continually communicate with your heavenly father. How do I step in this situation? How do I walk in this situation? I'm going to pray in the spirit on every occasion at all times, uh, everywhere. That, that means I can be praying, communicating with my heavenly father right now while I'm communicating with you. In other words, oftentimes I'm, I'm praying in the spirit up here while my mouth is moving, talking the word of God to you. And so literally what that means is, God, what do you want to say? What does your spirit want to say to my spirit so the words come out of my mouth and it speaks to somebody where they are today and it penetrates their heart? It's being in communication with your heavenly father. It's knowing who you belong to and who you are in Christ. But how many times do we fail to communicate with God on a continual basis? See, a lot of times we want to communicate with God when it gets bad. Oh, God, help my situation. Help my circumstance. And then other times we want to just praise God when it gets good. Oh, God, thank you for the blessing. Thank you for the mountaintop. Thank you for everything you've given me, God. And we're to be thankful in all circumstances, in all challenges. But the Bible here says pray in the spirit, you know what, on all occasions, all the time. So that means I stay in a continual communication with the Father. In other words, he's the God. He's the Lord. Let me say it this way. He's the commander. See, that's what it means. You don't always have to talk. If you're in an army, you don't always have to physically talk to the commander, but you can stay in communication with the commander. In other words, you can know what the voice of the commander is. You can know what the commander has said to do in this circumstance or this situation. In other words, the spirit of the commander has, has spoken to your spirit. And because the spirit of the general 
of God's army, Jesus has clearly spoken about who his church is to be. I'm asking you the question, are you operating and staying connected to God at all times through Christ Jesus, clearly communicating to him, God, you know what? I realize what's going on all around me. This world is crazy, but you said that we are to be who we are in Christ. We're to walk in unity together and do something amidst all the trouble and challenges. We're to pray for the family of believers. We're to be good to everyone, the scripture says. On all occasions and at all times, but especially to the household of believers. And my friends, this is the beautiful thing about belonging to a church. It's a household. It's a family. It's a group of people that stick together through it all. We understand purpose. We don't get it perfect every time. But we understand purpose. We understand gifting. We understand that there is a Lord. There is a leader. That's why the body calls him the head. Or the Bible calls him the head and us the body. In other words, he's, he's the leader. He's the one that guides it. He's the one that directs it. And you've got to be in constant communication with the Lord. It doesn't mean just sitting down and saying the blessing and thanking God for the Krispy Kreme donuts. It, you know, it's interesting, isn't it? You, you have to participate. It's one thing to ask God to do something. Many of us are praying for God to do a miracle right now. And we're asking God to do something that was, is more or less outside of, you know what, what, what he's called us to do and, 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 and be something. We just, we just want the comfort. But it says here, pray in the spirit. We need to pray audacious prayers, but we need to talk to God about what he wants to do in and through, not just me, but us as a church in the world. It's all about unity, my friends. It's not just about one person. It's, it's not just about a, a denomination It's about what does God want to do through bringing people together underneath the authority of Jesus, him being the Lord, us dressing ourselves in who he says we are as Christ followers, taking the sword of the spirit, his word, and stepping into this world, constantly staying in communication with the commander in chief. But also it says this in the last half of verse 18, and I love this. He says, stay alert. Stay alert. Everybody say, stay alert. He's speaking here how to stay unified, stay underneath the umbrella of who Jesus says we are. And and he says, stay alert because in this, you know, in this world, there's a lot of things that will distract you from your purpose and who God called you to be. He says, stay alert, stay alert because there's an evil one that wants to destroy the work of God in your life. Stay alert. And be persistent in your prayers, in your communication to God. For what? For all believers everywhere. And so what he's really saying here is is help each other. Stop fighting with each other and learn to pray for each other. It's, It's fascinating. Because the writer here declares that the real battle is not between flesh and blood. It's not between people. The the, the real battle is there's spirits and there's dominions of darkness in in the spiritual realm that blind people. That blind people from all sides, all kinds of ways. Busyness. You know, and we can begin to talk about how busy somebody is and, you know, uh, but the Bible says we're we're to pray for them. If they're a believer, pray that God begins to Uh, refocus them on their purpose to be a part of his family and do what he's called them to do. You know, again, lots of times busyness gets us distracted. There's all kinds of things that happen around us that gets us distracted. We, we don't, we don't always like everything everybody does and it gets us distracted. But, but here the writer is saying, look, stop focusing on things that distract you from being the church and being the light in the world. And start working together. Start operating together. Start using your gifts together. And together, you can become a unit 
underneath the authority of Jesus and, and the enemy don't win in the end. I know sometimes when these horrific things happen, it, it appears that evil is triumphing in the world. But if, if you read the scripture, the Bible says that there's going to be days and it seems like it's getting darker and darker and darker. But as those days seem to be getting darker and darker and darker, we're to take heart in who Jesus has, has, has made us to be as a church and a people, and we reflect his incredible light in the world. And in the end, he's going to win because all evil will be put in the abyss. Anyone who doesn't declare who Jesus really is and begins to hang on to the amazing love and power he showed through the cross and the resurrection. You know what? The evil forces are gonna end up taking them over, but God has come and he's given clear revelation, my friend. We, we live in a, a world today that's 2,000 years past the power of God showing up on a cross and defeating death and resurrecting from a grave and we can become inoculated to this good news. But the good news is he came to rescue us. He came to rescue us so we don't have to live in darkness. We don't have to be blinded anymore. We don't have to be in disarray with one another. We can begin to come together as one body and one family and accomplish great things in the world. Don't let the enemy isolate you, my friend. Don't let him take you out. Don't let him take you away. I know it's not always perfect when you step into the local church. But the good news is, is Jesus is perfect. And we're submitting ourselves to his authority. We're not, we're not trying to push our agenda. We're here to come underneath his authority and let him lord over our life and push the goodness of God out into the world. And so I'm inviting you into that. And again, you know, until we're willing to submit our life, and stop trying to control everything. We, we, really can't, we really can't understand the power of what God wants to do, the mighty power of what he wants to do through our heart and lives. And my friends, it comes by, by you taking your faith and you're submitting it to, to the love and the cross and the power of the resurrection. God came to reconnect you. But, but see, are you going to continue to let darkness win over your own personal life? Or are you going to allow the light of Christ to penetrate your heart and bring you out of that and put you into his family so you can operate and be exactly who he's created to be? We all have a choice to make. We can either choose to step into the fullness of who God is and, or, or we can choose to stay out. The Bible says get dressed daily. The Bible says pray in the spirit on a continual basis. The Bible says, be in prayer for believers everywhere. And my friends, when we do, we'll be operating by the mighty power of God. Let me pray for you today. God, you're an amazing God. I thank you for every person here today, God, no matter what their background is. And God, how you brought them here today to hear a word from you about how to begin to push evil out of our lives, out of our communities, out of our world. God, it's, it's simply by uniting our hearts together as human beings underneath the Lordship of Jesus. Jesus, we thank you that you are the Messiah, the liberator, the, the, the Lord, the captain, the commander, and that you've come in to this world and you've declared that the enemy no longer has the power to blind people if they so choose to believe in you. And my friend, if you've never believed in the cross and the resurrection of Jesus, that happen in time and space in this earth. I pray right now, you living over 2,000 years on the other side of that cross, that today you would put your faith that God did it for you. You just simply say, God, today I'm tired of doing life my way. And today I want to submit to your authority. I need you to become the Lord, the leader, and the Savior of my life. Say, God, rescue me through what Jesus did on that cross. And God, I believe in the resurrection that he defeated death and he can begin to defeat every enemy in my life whenever I put him on, on a daily basis. Tell God you want to be a part of his great plan, revealing him to the earth around you, to the world around you. And my friend, if you said that prayer, I want to say welcome to the family of God. And may God continue to do a miracle in your life 
And may God continue to link us together as one, as a family, to do amazing things in this world. In Jesus' name we pray this prayer today. Amen.